Shalom from Jerusalem. Ahlan wa sallam. This is our Middle East. Al-Shakar al-Sadlana, as they say in Arabic. And we'll learn from our guest today, Merdad Mari Yusufani, what we say in Persian uh, to welcome you to this Middle East-wide program. Very honored today uh, to have as our guest Merdad Mario Safani, a longtime senior advisor and former bureau chief to Crown Prince Reza Pahlavi, uh, and he is all things Iranian when it comes to strategy, when it comes to uh, a free and democratic Iran of tomorrow, and what to do about the authoritarian uh, extremist Iran, Iranian regime of today. Uh, so we're going to talk about the Iranian regime, the key to a free and democratic Iran of tomorrow. Uh, Mario Safani, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us long distance over the seas. Thank you very much. The phrase you are searching for is Khush Amadi. That means welcome in Persian. So add that to your vocabulary of welcoming your guests in the future. We absolutely certainly will. And we're going to have a, a window on our Middle East, uh, reserved for the uh, dramatic developments taking place with the Iranian regime and also taking place in the Iranian diaspora. Eight million Iranians in the diaspora, many of them living uh, in freedom, uh, in, uh, in democracy and prosperity. And that those are three essential components for, a, for, an, Irani, for an Iran of tomorrow. Free, liberty, freedom, liberty, democracy, prosperity. Um, Merdad Yusufani, what is the importance of the Iranian, what's called the Iranian opposition, or I would call the pro-freedom Iranian lobby in the West, when it comes to challenging this uh, really difficult uh, 44-year-old author authoritarian extremist theological control of the Iranian regime? Well, as we know, history is uh, is is has, has multiple examples of uh, where uh, members of the diaspora, if you will, uh, scattered all over the world uh, or exiled uh, communities as, as uh, we are referenced uh, to, uh, you know, they are examples of how a society uh, can respond to conditions where freedom, opportunity, and free enterprise is afforded them, as opposed to a contrast inside Iran today, where the same Iranian people with the same intellectual capacity and industry are absolutely disallowed uh, uh, to, to flourish as they are with their counterparts in the West. So uh, our diaspora plays a very, very important role in setting that example. And of course, those like myself who feel uh, uh, strongly connected, believe that we have the responsibility to give back and do as much as we can to be of support to the Iranian people themselves. You know, uh, Merdad, there is a deep historical connection between Am Yisrael, the Jewish people uh, living in Sion, living in their historic homeland uh, in Israel for the last 3,700 years, and the Iranian people, the the, the uh, the Persian, the, the great Persian, uh, em the Persian Empire and civilization. Uh, how important is this historic connection, uh, an historical connection, when talking about uh, the the liberation, the freedom uh, of Iran, of the Iranian people, 88 million Iranian women, men, children, uh, and, and their challenge today? Well, that's a very good point, Dan. I, I also feel very strongly about the significance, the importance of, uh, if you will, the, the realliance of the Persian and the Jewish civilization, which have, in fact, been intertwined for the past 3,000 years plus. Uh, let's not forget, Iranians, Persians, have, for the past 3,000 years, have had multiple religions, ethnicities, groups that have lived on the Persian plateau, including the Jewish uh, 
community, uh, which preceded Islam. So when we look at the relationship between the Persian and the, the, the Jewish civilization, I think that's a natural alliance that has always existed. Uh, it's only been for the past 50 or 60 years, uh, well, uh, 45 years under the regime, where the narrative of anti-Semitism under the guise of political discourse and, and disagreement with the state of Israel, Israel has been promoted by the regime. And I think uh, it's important to put that in the past and rebuild on the deep roots that the Persian Jewish people have had in Iran for millennia. You know, uh, Murdadi, you have a very successful, highly skilled, highly intellectual and prosperous Iranian diaspora in the United States. We have uh, well over a million Iranian Americans. And yet one notices over the last nearly four and a half decades that it has been a great challenge to convene a, 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 a unified um, singular voice on behalf of freedom, liberty, and democracy in Iran. What, what is the nature of that challenge when it comes, and I always turn to America because America really is the great modern model for freedom and liberty and democracy, I think, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the modern world. Why has it been so difficult for an American, or Iranian-American unified leadership to raise its voice. I'm, I'm thinking of Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. I'm thinking of the Jews, Soviet Union, I'm sorry, Soviet, uh, Soviet Jewry campaign in the 1970s. Help us understand the challenges and the difficulties when it comes to uh, Iranian leadership in the United States. Well, um, I think it's important to extract the, the American hyphenation here because when you're talking about the diaspora's connection with with the Iranian people, they are uh, engaged in that process as Iranians. Um, where they reside is secondary. Um, the numbers in the United States is, is uh, upwards of two million, two and a half, possibly three million in the United States. And what you are referencing to is, in fact, a reflection of the diversity of ideologies, philosophies, uh, ethnicities, and the various political backgrounds that our community has. It is not a monolithic uh, diaspora, and thus when you have a colorful community, our diaspora number is somewhere in between six million, uh, five to six million worldwide, and because it is not monolithic, you have a variety of groups that are very vibrant, very vocal, very much aspiring to be represented. And so you do not have a single brand or a single name or a single political party or ideology that stands out. Now, this is not an exception. All exiled politics are uh, messy, if you will. Politics are messy. Look at what we have here in the United States. Look at what you have there domestically in Israel. So it's no different. Politics is a game of power play. Politics is a, is a game of organization, infrastructure building, and the Iranian diaspora is finding its way uh, through having an internal debate, which gets messy when it spills out. But it's nothing unusual. But I, the good news is I think it's coming together. And um, we are actually, the Iranian people in the exile committee are much more focused than they have been ever before. It, Marty, is the uh, exilic community, and I, I'm going to turn back to the United States again, because if there is a political system of representation of the people, uh, and a government of the people, by the people, it's the United States, and it's brilliant, uh, uh, I would call, experiment of liberty through the Constitution and, and representative democracy at its very best. Uh, how... What is the challenge of bringing the Iranian issue from the ground up to to that House of Representatives, to the Senate? We haven't seen, uh, and again, I referenced Soviet Jewry movement, uh, the free Soviet Jewry movement in the 70s, uh, in, in which you had uh, a real unity uh, among 
American Jews from the left to the center to the right around the idea of freeing Soviet Jewry. What does it take to mobilize um, the the type of political uh, currency and, and and political power in order to create a ground up movement in the United States? Yeah, that's key actually, Dan, and and I think you used uh, the exact perfect. Uh, phraseology to capture what's needed, political currency. Let's define that. Political currency, during the period you reference in the Soviet era, and as you referenced the, 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 the American Jewry uh, that was part of the grassroots and uh, legislative uh, uh, infrastructure in America, requires what? Representation. The Iranian-American community has yet to find its way into the House of Representatives, for sure, the Senate. And so until we have members of the Iranian-American community individually represented, it'll be difficult to basically create a caucus of Iranian sympathizers. That is forming, possibly through some representations where our communities are concentrated, California, Texas, here in the Maryland, Virginia, New York um, uh, 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 areas, but nothing replaces having Iranian Americans personally represented. So until that happens, it'll be a long way to come. Uh, but I think there has been great progress. Um, the, the the past year uh, has sort of awakened not only the world but the American um, uh, congressional. Uh, districts and 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 with respect to them, their uh, representatives and senators who are much more aware and are much more vocal. We just saw the passing of the Massa Act, Massa Amini Act. That's a reflection of the focus and uh, getting good representation and attention now. In fact, uh, uh, Jenna, or she's known as Massa Amini, otherwise known in her Druze by her mom and dad, uh, or are Druze uh, extraction as Jenna. Kurds. Kurds, yeah. Yeah, Kurds. Um, that, in fact, there is something that uh, we learn called the Masa Revolution, uh, meaning that it wasn't just that this young lady who refused <clears throat> to bind her hijab in the way that the morality police of the Iranian regime had demanded of her, but she basically unleashed a, a, a cry for freedom around the world, which was heard not only among the 88 million people of Iran, but it was really heard in every corner uh, of, the, of, of the world and in, in every corner uh, and part of the free world. Uh, help us understand why this is called the Masa, the revolution, as opposed to just another heroic act uh, of, um, you know, of, of standing up to the regime by an individual. Yeah, uh, what well, is important, uh, you're correct, Dan, in that, uh, you know, it was not unique. Uh, this we have daily, daily uh, courageous acts of defiance throughout Iran, especially by the Iranian women. But just the innocence and 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 the simple uh, counterintuitive loss of life that Mahsa Amini, a, a young, beautiful, very attractive, uh, uh, smiling. And Mahsa Hamini uh, captured uh, was basically a reflection of the Iranian women's daily, daily struggle in itself capturing the Iranian people's daily struggle. So everything coming together, basically the Mahsa moment uh, was the, cat the, the catalyst that triggered that massive, massive national uh, sort of reaction to her death uh, following the regime's uh, cover-up and lies and lies and cover-up. And so Massa really uh, brought together that, that entirety of the energy uh, that still is boiling, still is rumbling under the ashes in Iran. Uh, the Persians, we, we have an expression that references the the red coal under the, the ashes. Atish uh, is we say. It's there. It's very hot, very powerful. 
And just because the world didn't see an immediate uh, repeat of that revolutionary street force at the anniversary of Matza does not mean that the revolution is gone. Uh, it's simply gone to a different phase. It's reorganizing, refocusing, and will be uh, coming out with the thunder soon again. You know, the, um, the discussion and discourse inside Iran raises the troubling issue that the United States uh, has just supplied the Iranian regime with billions, six billion dollars uh, in, um, you know, cash securities, uh, usable currency, tra a transformative currency for them, which the internal discussion asserts will be used primarily to finance uh, the coffers of Iranian terror proxies across the Middle East. And we're, for, our, for our viewers, we're talking about Iraq, we're talking about Syria, we're talking about Lebanon, and even arching over into Gaza where there are Iranian agents on the ground as we speak, as well as in Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the former West Bank of Jordan, where Iranian operatives and proxies are, are now in towns like Jenin uh, and Nablus, and others, which has triggered Israeli military counterterrorism campaigns. So what what is it that uh, perhaps the United States doesn't understand? Are they willingly blind? Is there a challenge of cognitive dissonance of legitimizing the very regime that keeps um, subverting uh, its own people, killing its own people and targeting Israel among all the nations, uh, targeting this mini state of Israel? Um, declaring its intention to towards policide or the destruction of one nation state uh, around the world. Help us understand this very confused picture. Uh, yeah, uh, to paraphrase uh, a good friend, uh, James Carmel, it's the optics, stupid. Uh, so this $6 billion, it's, it's the optics at this critical junction that just does not make sense. And while we all know diplomacy is very, very complicated, timelines are not predetermined, yes, we know the Iranian regime is very clever in timing the exact moment and release of the dollars, just like it was very clever in the exact moment of the release of the 444 days held hostages under Carter. Yes, we see all of that, and it's quite very frustrating. Uh, so... Uh, to make a case in terms of the human value of the release of those uh, human beings, two of whom are personal friends, were are personal friends of mine, um, that stands on one side. And then this whole process of what it means exactly releasing uh, uh, $6 billion, it's confusing not only to the world, but especially to the people, Iranian people inside as well as to the Iranian people within the diaspora. And it's very, very easy to manipulate that emotion in that context. Um, the fact here is currency is fungible. So when the United States uh, Department of State and Treasury say, well, this money is limited and held for expenditure for humanitarian, we all know fungibility of currency means if you're not spending six billion dollars on on health care food and medicine that six billion dollar elsewhere is going to go for other activities so that that is where the optics is a problem and but i submit uh, that the economic catastrophe that the iranian regime uh, has brought onto itself Six billion dollars, a sizable money, yes, but it is already absorbed, already probably spent because it is so much deep. It's so deep in a hole that that money will really not be consequential. The optics are terrible. The optics are terrible. Uh, talk about optics. Israel, uh, as small as the country is, has really been a pace setter in the free world, and I would, uh, I would have to say, objectively speaking, that Prime Minister Netanyahu has been outspoken and consistently determined uh, to prevent Iran 
uh, from getting nuclear weapons, which in, the, in, in Netanyahu's estimate has always been the red line is uranium enrichment, not the, uh, the retrofitting of a ballistic intercontinental ballistic missile or any other kinds of warheads that can carry non-conventional uh, weapons or, nu- for, uh, or clearly or nuclear weapons. What, what is Netanyahu seeing that other, you know, whether it's the CIA or whether it's MI6 or whether, it, you know, there are other, uh, other intelligence agencies out there across the Western world, and they're very good intelligence agencies, what are they afraid of or not seeing? I, I, I just, it just brings to mind a recent trip to London in which a public official was heard to say that if we uh, proscribe the IRGC, the Iranian Revolu- the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran, then we have no chance, said the, the British official, of, of diplomatic um, uh, intervention, if you will, with the Iranian regime. There's something missing here that Israel has consistently for the last 25 years taken the lead in the free world to stop the Iranian regime. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, both statements are true. Both viewpoints are true. Uh, diplomacy is all about statecraft and, and if you will, uh, diplomatic uh, infrastructures, uh, communica- communicating and consulting and working things out. So that's a mission of a diplomatic process. Uh, uh, what... Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, I believe, has done is that he has very, very uh, 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 cleverly been able to simplify the message. Yes, it's not the final point, it's the process. Uh, If intelligence communities and diplomatic discourses have to establish milestones in terms of red lines, uh, what Prime Minister Netanyahu has said, irrespective of those milestones, look at the trend line, look at the direction. And so that's where he has simplified the conversation and the narrative, uh, uh, reminding the world that irrespective of those milestones, which are constantly being moved out, look at the direction. The direction is irreversible. And I believe as as an Iranian, um, I, I tend to agree that the process, uh, the nuclear program in itself, whether they actually take the final step or not, is designed to position Iran at a point whereby it'll be one step away from having the final act. So um, the point is, do we want the Iranian a regime with this nature have its finger on that sort of an, uh, a trigger or not. It, don't forget, it's the nature of the beast, not the button itself. So in, when we discuss the nature of the beast, and I remember my teacher, uh, the great Bernard Lewis, uh, who passed away a couple of few years ago at the age of 102, he used to say, be careful, Western world, about creating a false patriotism by, by punishing the Iranian public with, with these punishing sanctions, which had been a strategy uh, of Israel, been a strategy of the last American administration uh, before it entered what was called the JCPOA, uh, which had not been revived. What is, how should we be thinking about leveling punishing sanctions to um, essentially create a chokehold on the regime. And even if it causes pain, what we call trickle-down pain into the Iranian uh, public, the good men and women who are, you know, have been suffering for 44 years there. Yeah. Um, in fact, we share that. Uh, uh, we share uh, the memory of the late Bernard Lewis in common. I also had the distinct pleasure of uh, being a student of his uh, uh, having read all of his books and having benefited from hours and hours of exchange, he was truly a great man. Uh, but uh, not to diverge here, uh, this is the ultimate question of sanctions globally and historically. Uh, we have seen that ultimately autocratic regimes leverage sanctions to convey a picture of 
uh, uh, hypocrisy. Uh, why? Because they say our failures are because of the sanctions. They actually increase the pressure on the people, denying them adequate food, medicine, and all of those needs that any society has, extends their suffrage while because of its own grip on power enriches itself and then blames the West and the sanctioner. So this has ultimately always been the game that uh, um, dictatorships and theocracies uh, 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 and autocracies have always played. And so today we are going through the exact same. I think part of the uh, uh, solution here is to make sure these tank, uh, sanctions are A, targeted, very cleverly and carefully targeted, and B, enforced. We have a situation right now where some of these sanctions are not targeted and for sure not enforced. So that is where you have a perfect chaos, whereby your sanctions are not being effective, the regime is benefiting from referencing it as the cause of the people's misery. At the same time, we are not enforcing them and allowing the re regime to benefit from uh, uh, the cake and eating it as well. So this is where this administration currently, uh, the Biden administration, has really been caught in a bind not knowing exactly which direction to go. It wants to be firm and serious on one front. It wants to be gentle and diplomatic and, and come across as, as empathetic on the other hand. But when you want to mix the two, uh, it's not been giving the right, uh, if you will, optics to the Iranian people. It looks confused. It looks weak to the eyes of the Iranian regime. It looks confused to the eyes of the Iranian people. It looks confused to the eyes of the Iranian diaspora. So it's been lose-lose uh, all around. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Amer uh, U.S. allies in Europe and the Middle East are also affected by the absence of enforcement. So they're also at a loss at what to do as well. So uh, I think we need to have a, a complete re-evaluation of this sanctions regime and see where it can be strengthened by it being targeted and where it can be strengthened by being it being actually enforced. Let's talk about evaluating, if we're using the word evaluation, let's evaluate this moment. It seems from the outside that there is something uh, critical about this particular moment. The regime is weak. The regime is compromised. There, there are cracks in the regime, according to those who have deep knowledge and even former affiliations with the regime, the, the people are mobilized by the Masa moment and her sacrificing her life. The internet, cell phones, social networks, ground up diplomacy, ground up activism. It seems that there is a perfect storm brewing right now in order to uh, not only crack, but possibly kill off uh, the uh, the authoritarian regime that has been uh, just making the lives of, of, of tens of millions of, of Iranians impossible. I, am I exaggerating the case? Are we, or are we in this momentous moment, if you will, that we haven't seen in years past? No, I think you're actually correct, Dan, but a caveat, uh, uh, important caveat here, because uh, intuitively, human nature is uh, expectations, expectations, expectations. Uh, in this society, we are all about immediate results, immediate service, drive up, get your burger and run. Uh, revolutions are meant to be once in a lifetime, once a century uh, events. And when we talk about the formation of the perfect storm, which I believe and I subscribe to, we expect that, okay, you know, we turn on television today in the morning and they tell you exactly 12 o'clock, the thunders are going to come and you look at 12 o'clock, where is it, why is it not there? This perfect storm that is assembly, assembling is a monstrous one emerging. It's gathering steam, it's gathering energy, 
It's rumbling and tumbling. It will break. It will break at some point soon. Those dark clouds are there. Uh, all of the elements are there. Everything, all requisites for a, a, a storm is there. When would it break is the unpredictable moment. And this is where the world needs to be very careful uh, in terms of pacing its expectation, pacing the expectation of the Iranian people inside as well as those within the diaspora and in terms of not setting firm timelines, in terms of not advancing the storm and claiming leadership of it before it breaks. And, um, and now, now is the moment uh, as we, we want to close this part of our discussion. I know you have more to say. If I can prevail upon you just to hold the thought because we're going to continue this discussion and, and make it into a mini-series, if you will, uh, of um, the issues are so stark and present uh, that we will uh, continue. We talked about a timeline. We're going to link this discussion to the next one. And if you will indulge me to thank you, uh, Merdad Mario Safani, senior Iranian-American strategist, former senior advisor to Crown Prince Reza Pahlavi, and, uh, and very uh, well-known and recognized globally, an activist, uh, and, and a, I would even say, not only behind the scenes, but, but someone who's taken a very public uh, strategic stance in this uh, uh, legendary fight for freedom and liberty, democracy for the Iranian people. Thank you ever so much for joining us on Our Middle East, and we will see you very soon as we continue this dramatic discussion. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, looking forward to our follow-ups.